shift over here. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. Um, on behalf of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, I wanted to welcome to you welcome you to what I think is a very special program, a celebration of Los Angeles's new poet laureate, Lynn Thompson. Um, my name is Quentin Ring, and I am the executive director of Beyond Baroque. For those who don't know, we are a literary space located in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing and presenting contemporary literature and art. Tonight, we're incredibly honored to have not only Lynn join us, but also three other exceptional poets, Hiram Sims, uh, freshly arrived from traffic, uh, Gail Ronsky, and Mariano Zaro. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. I also want to say a few words about Beyond, Bar Beyond Baroque's upcoming events. Uh, for the time being, our program re programming remains entirely on online. Um, we're starting to consider how we might reopen. Um, but we do have a variety of workshops coming up. Uh, these include a one-day master class with the poet Bridget Bianca, uh, a six-week course on the literary submission process with Sochi Huliso Bermejo, and a workshop focused on Ramadan and anti-Islamophobic organizing with the poet and activist Tenzil Ahmed. Um, please, please do check those out. Um, I think they're going to be great programs. Um, additionally, we have our ongoing free weekly workshops. On Wednesdays, we have poetry with Beth Ruscio. And on Mondays, we have fiction with Raquel Baker. Um, we'll put the link for some of those in the chat. You can also uh, find them on beyondbaroque.org. Um, for National Poetry Month, uh, we, we have not only this reading, but we're the programming partner for the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books Poetry Stage. Uh, we'll be announcing a stellar roster of poetry videos in just a few days. Do stay tuned for that. Those videos will be released over the latter part of April. And we also have a special virtual exhibit featuring multidisciplinary poets and artists, Celeste Goyer, Holiday Mason, and Jim Cushing. They'll be giving a reading and a talk uh, focused on the exhibits on April 23rd. Um, and finally, we're especially excited to announce our May 6th fundraiser, Beyond This Moment. This is a fundraiser intended to help us make repairs to our space um, so that we can reopen it to the public. Um, Beyond Baroque is a, is a truly landmark space that has nurtured generations of writers and artists, including Wanda Coleman, Van X, Mike Kelly, and America's youngest ever inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman, uh, who got her start in our workshops just a few years ago. Um, Amanda Gorman will be joining us for the fundraiser. She'll be giving a reading, as will Pulitzer Prize winner Tahimba Jess, Los Lobos founder Louis Perez, MC5 guitarist Wayne Kramer, and our own special guest for this evening, Lynn Thompson. Uh, if, so if you can't get enough of Lynn, please do come back for that. I, I can't get enough of Lynn, she's amazing. Um, so let's talk about this program. Um, there's a whole lot that's been wrong with the world this past year. Um, so I'm very glad that one thing that has been absolutely perfectly unquestionably right is the fact that Lynn Thompson has been named our new poet laureate by the city of Los Angeles. Um, she is an astonishing poet. Um, and I might add, she's a truly wonderful person. Um, and I think, you know, this is very much a civic role. Um, and I think she's going to do a whole lot to further poetry in the city. I can't think of a better ambassador um, for the, the community of poets in this city. Um, and I'm just so thrilled that she has been named by Eric Garcetti um, to this position. Um, this is one of her first events in her new role. Um, and I'm especially glad to be here to celebrate her because uh, as one of the few institutions devoted to poetry in the city, I've gotten to know Lynn um, as an incredible artist and person over several years. And so Lynn, I'm just absolutely thrilled for you. Um, I'm so glad that this, um, that you've been honored in this way because you truly deserve it. Um, before we get to Lynn though, we have three terrific poets um, reading, um, poets that I, I really love very much, each of their work. Um, we're going to start with Mariana Zaro, um, then we'll go on to Gail Ronsky, and then Hiram Sims, and we'll finish with Lynn. So just to start, um, I'd like to introduce Mariano. Um, I should also mention that please do uh, um, consider buying, um, buying our artists' books today. We'll, you'll find the link in the chat. Um, that is a huge help to them as well as to us. Um, but Mariano Zaro is the author of six books of poetry most recently Decoding Sparrows uh, and Padre Tierra. His poems have been included in the anthologies Monsterverse, Wide Awake, 
The Coiled Serpent, and in several magazines in Spain, Mexico, and the United States. He is a professor of Spanish at Rio Hondo Community College, and I am very glad to be able to welcome he him here this evening with us. So Mariano, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you for um, that introduction. Um, and um, thank everybody for coming here today to celebrate Lynn Thompson, the new Los Angeles uh, uh, Laureate Poet, Poet Laureate. Um, and, um, and thank you, Lynn, for uh, inviting me to read with you today, and also with uh, Gail and Hiram. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm going to read uh, three poems. Uh, the first one is uh, the title poem of my book, uh, Decoding Sparrows, that was published by uh, What Books Press in uh, 2019. Decoding Sparrows. My father and I on the balcony watch dozens of sparrows walking on the roofs across from us. A sparrow doesn't really know how to make a nest, he says. They are messy. Now a stork, that's different. A stork makes a perfect nest. My father looks at the clouds. Can you tell a male from a female sparrow? He says. No, I can't, I say. What do they teach you in a school, son? He says. Look, male sparrows have a dark stain on the chest, like a bib or an apron. Females don't. And I look, and there they are, chests with aprons, chests without aprons, everything in order, dirty or clean, white or black, male or female. I cross my arms against my chest. My father doesn't look at me. And then he says, but we are not sparrows, you know. I am writing lately a series of poems that borrow language from medicine, biology, and other disciplines. And this is one of those poems. The title is On a Silver Platter. On a silver platter. The world has become heavy, I tell my doctor. A door's handle, a page in a book, an empty glass. I want you to see this, she says. She points at a blurry image on her computer screen. She wears a wedding band, but I don't want to know anything about her. I don't want her to have a husband children, parents, siblings. This is your spine, she says, from C1 to L5. Do you see these spots? Yes, I say. What are they? Sadness, she says. Are you sure, I ask? It's a clear case, she says, the location, the shape, the density. Some patients present transparent sadness. We call it type zero, very difficult to diagnose even using a dye for contrast. Yours is translucent, type one. And it's shaped like pellets, you see, very common in this type of sadness. Type one stays close to the spine, may cause weakness, trembling, paresthesia, night sweats, sexual dysfunction. Type two, the opaque sadness is shaped like filaments that run alongside the muscle fibers. There is also type three. It's web-shaped, settles around the neck. Patients describe it as having a bridle around the throat, produces speech impediment sometimes muteness. The last identified sadness is called inner type, she says. It generates in the amygdala. It looks like a rain of electrical spores 
that can reach any part of the body. Does type one explain my symptoms, I ask. We can't be sure, she says, we're still in the early stages of research, but sadness explains many things. What should I do, I ask. Some patients try to rest more and calm down, but sometimes they fall into hypersomnia, she says. Some patients cry. Some play sports because of dopamine release. Some listen to music, Bach, most of all. I don't like sports, I say, but I like Bach. What do you do with your own sadness, I ask. I just keep plowing, she says. Will I improve, I ask. You will, she says, but there is no cure for sadness. It stays with you always. What about future sadness, I ask. We will cross that bridge when we get there. Do you pray? Meditate, she asks. Not really, I say. How can the body function with all this sadness, I ask. That's a mystery, she says. But some scientists theorize that the body wouldn't be able to function without sadness, just a hypothesis. Do you think we could survive a lifelong load of sadness delivered in a single day, I ask. She plays with her wedding band. Imagine all your sadness, doctor, at once on a silver platter, I say. All at once on a silver platter, she repeats like the head of John the Baptist. And I'm gonna close with one poem. Uh, it's, a, it's a new piece. And this is the first time that I am read this in front of an audience. And I hope uh, in the near future it could be, or it can be a, a live audience. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for, for coming. The title of this poem is Brother. Brother, who is that boy? I ask my mother. I am pointing to a black and white picture framed on a bookshelf. He is your brother, she says. The toddler is standing next to a stroller, wears a small hat, it's a summer day. This is not the first time I have seen the picture. This is the first time we talk about it. I am six years old. Where is he now, I ask. He's dead, my mother says. What happens when you die, I ask. Where do you go? Nobody knows, she says. Everything is the same. Everything is not the same. How did he die, I ask. Fever, dehydration. What is dehydration, I ask. He died of thirst, she says. He was born April 27th, 1960. He died July 18th, 1961. It was a Tuesday. I was born April 15th, I say. Yes, April 15th, 1963. It was a Monday, she says. All my children came to me, all of them but you, my mother says. I looked for you. I had to look for you because I was old, they said. Where was I, I ask. You were inside your father, she says. Did my brother have toys, I ask. Yes, she says, but I told your aunts to take everything away, the toys, his shoes, all his clothing. You shared the same crib though, but not the clothing. I couldn't do that to you. Was he better than I am, mother? She touches my hair. He was strong, 
she says, he brought you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mariano. That was stunning as usual. Um, it's always such a pleasure to hear you read. Um, next up, we have Gail Ronsky. Uh, Gail's newest book is Under the Capsized Boat We Fly, new and selected poems available April 13th uh, from White Pine Press. I think that's on Tuesday. Um, she is the author of numerous books of poetry, prose, and translation. She, she teaches creative writing and women's literature at Loyola Marymount University. Gail, welcome and thanks for reading. Thank you, Quentin. And uh, thanks, Mariano. That was a beautiful reading. I love hearing you read. Um, and it's a great, great honor and a delight to be here reading with Lynn Thompson as one of her friends. Lynn has more friends than anyone I know. So she could have asked almost anyone in the city to have been up here reading. So thank you, Lynn, for asking me. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you all for coming. I hear we have a huge audience. That's great. Um, I'm going to read a couple of Ars Poetica uh, poems, first of all. And those are poems which are written about the art of poetry. This one is from my new book. It's called Poetry. Whether it comes nude and ardent to you, or whether it beckons out of faraway cypresses, whether it be astute or swallowed up in your endangerment, embedded in your window's sheen, an impeccable enigma, you parting the clouds with imagination's keenly lit tentacles can graze the inalienable formalities of its murmur. I can see plain day and its masters making the reaping machinery of purgatory glisten in the deepest starfires of your eyes. By all means, be beguiled by this. And then I'll describe the agitation in my labyrinth, how exquisite it has been to lift from a wayside altar poetry's quickening string. How like being in love, the injury cringing in the mirror vanishes as you pass it, loaded down with death, leaving behind only a dazzling gust of panic and happiness. And this is a poem, I'm reading this for my students. I know some of you are here. It's a poem I wrote when I was their age and it's also an Ars Poetica and it's a much different tone. It's a little more punk rock. It's called The Main Attraction and it has an epigraph from Clanth Brooks that says, Wordsworth's imitation ode then is not only a poem, but among other things, a parable about poetry. How now? Come see the tiny cow. It's only two and a half inches tall. Used to be a professional pallbearer at the ant farm, then it lost that leg. Come on and see it. It does a great imitation of Mae West, you know, swaying a little bit top heavy. Why don't you come up and see it? I bet it could get a college degree in being cute and knowing what's what. Why, just the other day, it looked at me like it knowed what I said to Brenda last night, which was, quit crying, bitch. That little cow needs us to be brave. <laughs> Um, and the third one is e even more recent than the poems in my book. It's just a short um, poem, Ars Poetica, called I've Always Loved Rumi. A donkey will dig in dry mountain dirt for a petrified potato. I'm a poet. My divining rod pulls rubies big as small boulders out of the very same ditch. Rumi would say, the ruby and the potato are one. Both are kissed by the abyss, which every day 
we rise from, looking out with alien eyes at the stony face of a shining planet. Next, I'm gonna read a couple uh, short poems again. That's kind of what I write. Um, these are ones I think Lynn Thompson likes. So I'm reading them for Lynn. This is uh, from the new book. It's called Aging. We have not acclimated ourselves to the changes. Had we been articulate like the plants and prayerful to the moon, paying close attention to its scars wound with jasmine, had we been simple like the black sea glittering in love with its seabirds, had we not lived until winter, had the sky shuttered its thin blue eyelids, had our thinking atoned for us. Look, planet fields, tombs, our oneness, the cough of thunder reiterates the jerking progress of what is inevitable. On the threshold of death, only our dreams perseverance maintains its ongoing arguments with memory, with gardens, with the now or never everything of these vestigial days. Um, this is another short poem. It's uh, a poem. I'm writing a lot of short poems I call coffee poems and putting them up on Instagram. And it's been a riot. I tell you, it's been a lot of fun. And this is one I think Lynn commented on. It's called My Epaulets Are on Fire. You know epaulets, those, those things on the shoulders. My epaulets are on fire. And the person inside me is frightened. The flames are vertical, two wavering spirits standing upright in their graves. The silence here is like science, antiseptic, and the person inside me is dying to pat me on the back. I'm a poet. This is to be expected. If only we had a pair of asbestos gloves. If only we had arms. A couple more short poems and then I'm done. This is the Petty Infinite. The jasmine by my studio is flowering. Oh, simple life on the surface of the planet. My writing limbo oscillates before it. Then the other plants begin to wake up and the ground perks up. I am a mad woman living in the midst of such profound activity and such smallness. Let love take its chances here. Let love luminesce and mark time in this yellow mill wheel of days. We existed here where the owl swayed on top of the swaying cypress tree. What did we want from each other? To die having said it all, to win having lost it all, one fragile about face from the stars. And my last poem is called, The Only Thing We Have to Lose is Loss Itself. And this poem has so many double negatives in it, finally, I don't know whether it's a negative poem or a positive poem. <laughs> it's both, I'm sure. The only thing we have to lose is loss itself. Take from yourself what is always absent in you. You won't misinterpret the spring rain overflowing the gutter and splashing on the bricks. Take from yourself the pool of it and the sorrowing, the mouths on people's faces. You won't treasure these disappearances again until the death phone rings. For everything is ash choked, delighting in catastrophe. And for the person who can foresee the planet's foregone end, nothingness is of no use. In my world, not even the poem, rising from mud, rebellious and alone, loses its losses. I won't let it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. That was stunning. I love those coffee poems. They are fantastic. Um, just absolutely beautiful. Um, 
Next up, we have Hiram Sims. Hiram is a poet, essayist, short fiction writer, and creative writing professor at the Los Angeles Film School. He's also the founding director of the Community Literature Initiative. In addition to being a great fan of every writing in this writer in this reading, he is also incredibly handsome. I'll just add a couple more things about Hiram. One is he tells no lies. He's incredibly handsome. Um, the other is that the community literature initiative that he founded, I just want to give a plug for this. It's amazing. It's an amazing um, poetry workshop publishing class. Um, and he's also opened the Sims Library of Poetry, which I visited just a few weeks ago. Um, everybody who has a chance to go, I really recommend you guys going. It's a beautiful, beautiful space for poetry. Um, it's, it's, he's doing amazing work in the community. And he also happens to be an incredible poet. So please welcome Hiram Sims. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Quentin, for having me. Um, I'm gonna read a poem and then I'm gonna talk a little bit and then I'm gonna read another poem. Uh, this poem is called Poetry Kinfolk. And uh, it starts with a quote from Pablo Neruda that says, poor unlucky poets whom both life and death harass with the same dark stubbornness who then are smothered in mindless pomp, committed to rituals, to a funeral like a craw full of teeth. So this is poetry kinfolk dedicated to all the poets in the room. We probably came from the same plantation, last name lost in the decades, but still slave to the same words and rhythm, emancipated by law, but still bound to a lyric, both hands and feet, and one huge black ball and chain stitched to the finger and tongue. My folks, kin linked by umbilical sonnets, born to starve and write and starve, but always to be richly rewarded with one verse that will live forever. Poets, to be hated, ridiculed, then quoted always as if our work be scripture, to be loosely forgotten by most, but remembered and treasured by other neglecteds who will foolishly but passionately pay a college for a degree in this madness. We are an annoyance to the world since they delight only in our death, praise us and pay us only in our death and all of us die young. Keats, Shakespeare, Poe, a poet is not meant to survive. He is the clumsy white girl in the first three minutes of the horror movie. He is the black, heartless, unforgiving, murderous, well-dressed villain in every superhero story. He is the one of the 45 foot soldiers in between Donatello and Shredder who must die and be out of the way with one sharp kick. But we don't need that much time anyway. We are imposters hiding behind our masks of employment, determined to blend. We are social workers, but not really. We are dentists and cops and daycare employees, but not really. We are accounts payable dogs lapping up corporate leftovers until somebody throws it in our face that we are faking. I wish I could plan the family reunion, maybe back on the plantation, which is now a school for creative writing. I wish I could send for all of us with my reparations check. I wish we all could eat Ezra pound cake together and do the electric slide on a Walt Whitman leave of grass. And for one day, we could all see the resemblance and know that we are family, poor, forgotten, but family nonetheless. All right, so uh, I first wanna uh, give a shout out to Lynn Thompson, the poet laureate of the city of Los Angeles. I was like screaming when I found out I actually went in the kitchen and was screaming. My kids started jumping and screaming with me. And then three minutes later, they were like, well, why are we excited? And I was like, cause Lynn Thompson just became the poor laureate of LA. And then we went back to screaming and shouting in the living room. And so, you know, the best way I can describe it is like, uh, like if your auntie became the mayor, Right. And then you're like, oh, man, we rich now. Like we're going to Red Lobster every night. So that's kind of <laughs> how I still feel. Right. I'm still excited because, you know, this is the I've met the other poet laureates, you know, but this is the, the first one that I've that I've known, you know, that really became the laureate of my city. Right. Like the city that 
I grew up in. And so um, uh, I'm very, very excited. I just want to tell you that Lynn Thompson is incredibly supportive to the young poets. You know, there was, uh, my wife was a part of a, a, a choir and they had this phrase that said, lifting as we climb right and I feel like that's what Lynn Thompson does all the time right she's she's always climbing and always lifting the people who are you know uh you know coming after her and so uh, I opened the first Sims library of poetry in my garage and I called Lynn and some other poets and just said hey I'm opening up a library in my garage will you please bring books of poetry and she brought like 50 books of poetry she read a poem on stage in my backyard, right? I'm so so glad the sprinklers didn't go off, you know, like, but to me, that's the type of humility she has uh, when it comes to helping other people who are trying to do big things. Um, and when we opened uh, the larger space, uh, which is 2702 West Florence, if any of you wanna come by, um, any weekday from nine to three, uh, we had a little event again asking for books and she came again and gave several more boxes of books uh, to the library and then emailed me said, whatever y'all need, just let me know. So I'm just like so, so grateful for her just being a mentor to me and so many other poets uh, in this community. Um, when I was driving uh, down to where I am now, um, I was thinking about uh, Phyllis Wheatley, right? Um, in conjunction with this night, because one of my feelings is that uh, poetry gains its value over time. And sometimes people don't quite see it as valuable at first, but gain that consciousness later on. And, um, I was thinking about the fact that, um, and this is kind of connected to a conversation I had with Lynn after she became Phyllis, um, the, after she became the poet laureate, I was just saying that like, in my opinion, poetry is the black woman's art and they've done it better than everybody. And, you know, like going back to Phyllis Wheatley in 1761. And so, well, some of you already know is that when Phyllis Wheatley was brought to the United States at the age of eight on a slave ship, um, the slave ship, uh, you know, the slave holder, Timothy Fitch, um, was told not to bring back any children because they were hard to sell. But he came back with all men and women and one eight-year-old girl. And uh, when, when they got back to the United States, you know, um, you know the, the slave holder was scolded and they listed her as a refuse slave. And refuse means trash, right? Um, because they felt like she had no value, right? And many of you know her story. You know, she, 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 she published a book five years later called Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. You know, um, only the second woman to publish a book in the United States. But what was so interesting to me is um, five years ago, not, I'm sorry, eight years ago, a letter of Phyllis Wheatley sold at auction for $253,000, a letter, um, which is $1,400 a word, right? And I was just thinking, wow, how, how valuable, right? Just a sentence from her became, you know, over the course of time. So I'm so proud of the poetry of black women in this country, and especially that a black woman is representing us as the poet laureate of Los Angeles. So this second poem I'm gonna read was inspired by a visit um, that Lynn Thompson gave to my class. Uh, it was a Saturday morning class for the Community Literature Initiative, which is an organization that helps LA writers to write and publish books. Um, and so she gave an amazing lesson and the students uh, quickly realized that this was someone to ask a lot of questions to. And so they did that. And she, Lynn stayed for about 
40 minutes after she gave a 30 minute guest lecture to answer all of their questions. So I just appreciate that so much. And I know that she's a teacher. And so this is a poem that I wrote about just uh, the joy of teaching writing. Um, and this is dedicated uh, to, my, to my students. I live to see you write, exist in this very time to watch you carve life into dead wood with ballpoint chisels in cold or hot lyrical bakeries called classroom. I live to see you write, born to watch you cursing in cursive along the dark crease of paper, waiting and writing and waiting again for the great ideas to come in that only come on Monday nights for unexplainable reasons. I was born to watch you write, write this second, teaching you nothing while demanding everything be drawn from your reluctant fingertips, wet and thick with talent pouring out of your nail beds. I went to school to watch you write, went into a lifetime of debt to watch you write, buried myself six feet under Sally May soil, toiling for the breath I breathe in your iambic calligraphy. I live 25 inches below the poverty line just to see you write and look up and watch you look up searching for the predicate of your heartbreak and look down writing and look up at me thinking you're finished and I say with my silent eyes ain't no way in hell you're finished so keep writing I live to see you write your writing your story the journalism of your individual human life written in dandelions I live to see you bathing in rhythm knee deep in dactyls your trachea covered in trochies, colloquialism dancing across your tongue. This is not a fucking class. This is an excavation. Can you dig it? This is archeology span and I am drilling through 36 layers of topsoil trying to uncover the artifact of your honesty. And I live to see you living in the pages of your own book, tap dancing through your own table of contents, the boom and quiet of your own voice meandering through the margins, justified. Finally, rightly justified in your claim that something came out of you that people should have forever, read forever. There is meaning in your name, just as there is meaning in our name. And though our time together be short lived, I live to see you write. I live to see you writing your own history right here with me. Congratulations, Lynn Thompson. Woo, 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 woo. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Hiram. Um, thank you for the poetry and thank you for the words about Lynn. I could not put it any better myself. Um, it's just incredible to have all these fantastic poets uh, and people who do work in the poetry community here to pay tribute to Lynn um, because she truly deserves it. I'm not gonna to say too much more, except just to give you the formal bio for Lynn. Um, on April 24th, 2021, or sorry, on February 24th, 2021, Mayor Eric Garcetti appointed Lynn Thompson Poet Laureate for the city of Los Angeles. She is the first native Angelino to hold the post. Thompson is the author of Start With a Small Guitar, Beg No Pardon, which is the winner of the Perugia Book Award, and the Great Lakes College New Writers Award, and Fretwork, selected by Jane Hirschfield for the Marsh Hawk Poetry Prize and published in 2019. Her recent work appears or is forthcoming in Plowshares, New England Review, December, Black Warrior Review, and Best American Poetry 2020, as well as the anthology Shit Men Say to Me. Lynn, congratulations. Uh, it's truly an honor to have you here, and I'm just thrilled to hear you read. Well, I'm, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed and swole up with myself. Um, thank you. I couldn't have had three better representatives of poetry in the city to join me tonight. Thank you so much to Hiram, Gail, and Mariano. Your work was stunning. You are stunning. Your friendship has meant everything. Thank you, Beyond Baroque, Quentin, and Jimmy behind the scenes um, for everything that you've done for me and that you do for the poetry community. Um, thank you to all the attendees. I know I have a lot of family out there. That's very exciting. Um, 
to those of you I know, those of you I don't know, those of you that love poetry, those of you that are learning to love poetry, thanks so much for coming for, to what for me is a very special occasion. Um, uh, so I'm gonna jump into it. I'm gonna be reading some poems from each of my collections and then maybe a couple of, of newer ones. Um, very first poem in the very first book. The poet applying for a job cites her previous experience as a witness, passionate secret, collection of colors, rubbish, pins, puddles, buttons, paper, detritus to scrape, to paint, to polish, conjurer of mummery and feral thought, flotilla of aberrations, eccentric drop of ink, gnome on a trapeze, inclination, hand drum, obligato, vertigoed butterfly, professional sphinx, silence, sizzling arrow. And this for my parents who I am sure many of you know, because I talk about it all the time, um, immigrated to the US from the Caribbean, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This poem is for them. Song for two immigrants. I thought I knew you. To me, you were the Grenadines, the Anglican church and a cricket match every Sunday and every Sunday you were Fort Charlotte, the Vincey Mass and Blue Tide Pools. You were Arawaks sailing into Kingstown Harbor. You were English and French patois, rainforests, regatta and a Congo snake, whelk, roti, lobster and rum. Yeah, but here you are in a yellowing photograph shot in the Mojave or Death Valley CA, looking like deserters from an American war. Her, every bit the boy, hair slicked, leather jacket cinched at her throat, her tiny foot on the running board of a black 37 Ford coupe, and you looking nothing less than the black Clyde Barrow, flicking the butt of your lucky strike, checking out your boys at play in the dirt, wearing short pants and high tops, everyone looking for all the world as if the Caribbean was a dream. And it was, and it's clear, I did not know you. You should see this photograph. I mean, really, my parents look like criminals. To blackness, as it happens, I have never tired of blackness. It's Marcus Garvey raisin in the sun, Tuskegee Airmen. It's Strivers Row and liver lips. It's Dred Scott Freedman's Bureau, Scott Joplin. Some say black is swarthy, gloomy, evil, fiendish, but we all spring from the tribes. Ashanti, Bobo, Fulani, Wolof, their cowrie shells and crobo beads sewn into our fading fabric. I don't know much about my native blackness. My daddy, he say Ebo, the only word he can give me, but it's the only word I need to get the old folks to remembering that in Ebo, Ututu is morning, Abali is night, and in any mirror, my Ihu, my face is always black. Scissors. There's no synonym for scissors. Everyone with a rogues knows that. Rock, paper, scissors. And by cut, of course, you may mean score, sever, ab absent, dissect, disjoin, cleave, but scissors are instruments unto themselves. Just like you won't find a synonym for Utah or any other state. Many things just can't be said any other way. Toothache or mercurochrome or 1951. So when I say it's over, I don't mean interlude or maybe. So having heard that poem, um, I think it flows right into my second book, uh, shout out to What Books Press, um, Start With a Small Guitar. It, originally, some friends of mine said it was my book of love, no love poems, but um, I'm now thinking it's just my no love poems. 
I'll read two from this collection. But anyway, I am a woman. He knows that, knows it the same way he knows no matter how hard he tries to define himself as spark plug or whiskey neat. I will come back in the late night as I always do lately to prove myself more than otherworldly, to prove that whether he tosses, you can't hold me or cow patties in my path, I will grind all of it into the mute earth that has birthed him. Knowing doesn't make it any better, doesn't, doesn't stop the veins in his body from twisting, madly twisting the way a hundred spiders might twist upon themselves in a mirrored haunted house. He knows about haunted, about the axis in constant rotation, the inconvenience. No matter how hard he tries, the vision of my mouth and aspect remain, my mourning and my survival. My mourning and my survival. The vision of my mouth and aspect remains. No matter how hard I try, despite the inconvenience, the axis and constant rotation, I know about haunted, as in mirrored haunted houses, twisting upon themselves, madly twisting the way a hundred spiders might. The veins in my body knowing doesn't make it any better. Into the mute earth that has birthed me, I grind all of it. Put, you can't hold me and cow patties in the path wherever he tosses himself to prove myself more than otherworldly. Always and lately, in the late night, when I come back to define him as spark plug or whiskey neat, no matter how hard he tries. It's that way. I know that. A book of questions in the end. In the end, we are water and misery, misery and thin blood. I don't remember which. In the end, we put our feet into the sea and they return with an appetite to jog to the end of endings, of dynasties, of coral reefs and outer galaxies, scientific postulates and operatic rifts, this indeterminable language. In the end, None of our mothers are walruses, but their sons all carpenters, and they have no daughters in the end. This is an illogical conclusion, an imperturbable enigma. This isn't a polemic in the end. This isn't a slide rule or an immaculate kingdom. This no funeral march or declaration of dependence. This isn't a love letter. Was there ever real love at the end? That afternoon in Sicily or in Mexico where finally the champagne was no more sweet than in the back seat of our old car? And if in the end I loved, how do the seasons know they must change their shirt? And um, I'm going to read some uh, of more than a few from um, Fretwork, which is my latest collection. Um, most of you or many of you know that these are poems about family and the different ways we define family. This one, Trace. To unearth what came before, ask, how did they come? When? About 100 years before daddy left Barbados for New York, the schooner Irene arrived in Havana, 1822, guns mounted. 288 of the 331 free people put on board at Bonnie, disembarked, sold as slaves. Run, run. Of his surname, Thompson, think former owner, last owner, names lost, run away. Official records, state and church, run. Baptism, marriage, oral history, maps, registers, masks, run. Wills and archives, run away, away. Slave complaints, debts, laws, former slaves as owners of slaves, run. Auctions, away. 
they entered here. Intermixed. Although he chose to lie with another and turned absent father because of it, daddy hitched his fate to mother. Mother was fair in complexion, one clue being her name, cobbled together from low German, middle Dutch, some old English, Hessel, Hassel, Hazel, Hazel. But even that hegemony didn't deter him, proud as he was of his Ebo, proud he faced windward after the bite of Biafra, bite of Bonnie. Pleased to feed his family cassava root, cassava and taro root. In a time when many thought he would not have been, he was learned. When he looked at her, when he spoke her name, he might have thought, let the angler fit himself with a hazel of one piece or two set conveniently together, Cox, 1677, or the note of Hassel Springeth, Hazlitt, 1864. He might have thought of her as his hazel wand or hazel hooped or a dervish of hazel wizard, healing his scarifications, her body fully salt fish and chickpea. What he thought is lost to time, but never can be. He anointed himself with oil of hazel. See his children sitting, as Virgil said, beneath the grateful shade which hazels intermixed with elms have made. Um, I think this is the first time I'm actually reading this in public and I was very surprised that it was the one that the mayor decided to, to quote from when he made the announcement of my selection. So I thought I'd read it in full tonight. Hammer and pick. Long before I came along, a dream. Daddy told his boys he was glad for any kind of work and FDR with his New Deal politics was his guy, always there. If it wasn't for the WPA, my brothers say, they would have had nothing to eat, pain and glory. Daddy's talent to draw a bow across a fiddle wouldn't keep a roof over our heads, and he was happy to go down to the sewers instead of waiting. Glad to slip below the earth before sunrise to return to it in starlight. Undeterred, built a railroad swung the hammer and pick. The other men, twice his size and strength, but daddy did whatever he was told. Now he's done. He wasn't thinking of history, only hoped his boys would survive another potatoes and water supper. Don't you remember? The brothers say they were better off than many. They were the ones with the drum. I don't know if my two uh, sister-in-laws for whom this poem is written are on, but um, it is written for Sonia and Karen. And again, based on a photograph. Photograph, Oriola Boulevard, Easter, 1963. We're all there. My sisters-in-law and their Jackie Kennedys. Our neighbor, Janet, from across the street, whom we pray can be brought to Jesus Although all I really want is her dark and glossy ponytail hidden beneath a chapeau of crepe de chine. And yes, of course, my mother, Queen Cluck, sporting gloves of such elbow length white, they seem to promise everything, everything is possible. Then me on the end, all candy striped ribbons, scarred knees, little hope, our virtues trapped by a brownie, does anyone know what that means anymore? Do we rise? Trust me, your mother will haunt you all your life one way or another. And that's what this poem is about. Cryptogram. She came back again last night in my dreams. She lounged atop my library of scribbles. I don't know how she got there. But while I wanted to speak of joy, mother only wanted to speak of collapse. Neither of us said love, that burr and mystery. She arrived without, unclothed, salt 
in each hand, caught in the wrong. My knees bent to an unnecessary apology, an infinite sentence, no hyphen. It was a long night. Moonstone and the rush of her. And this one about all families, I think. The Mollusk Museum. One, family is and is not a velveteen pillow. Theater, a dinner hour mistake with candied yams on the side, a box at the bottom of. Flightless penguins hitchhiking through town. Footprints in a cemetery. Two, symmetry. Two moon pies per gypsy, greedy art and dirigible need brushes and reeds, tracing paper on papyrus, the solo, the ensemble, wood ticks, wax moths, hand drum thrum thrumming the hand, a river, a poplar, the same old questions. Three, war. I come to struggle, to eat the edges of, to abrade the chemical and the all chemical in the falling night. Always a souvenir wrapped in a rigmarole. Vivaldi versus Jay-Z. I'm wrapped in biblical passages, but never in any book of revelations or Koran or green hornet. All is taboo. Every day is like any other habit. A telegram never opened. So those are the those are the books, um, and I'm just going to read uh, uh, three newer poems, and then you're released to go wherever. Um, this first one is in honor of the fabulous local treasure Betty Sarr, wonderful artist. If you don't know her work, you should find it. And I built this poem on her uh, titles of many of her pieces. It's called Assemblage, and she is an assemblage artist. I was born from the time in between in the house of tarot, born of Our Lady of the Shadows and I have survived 10 secret mojos. I got a conjure bag, got good luck tokens, some herbs. I know how to catch a unicorn because I am a spirit catcher. I am not the high priestess, but I have a view from a sorcerer's window and I have never belonged to the black cross in the white section only. I am not one of those midnight Madonnas, but neither am I a rainbow babe in the woods. Sometimes I dream about my grandmother's house when it was Indigo Mercy. Was she bequeathed me her house of the open hand so I wouldn't live anyone's imitation of life. So I could live as lullaby or Sheba, red bone and black crossing. This poem, I was so fortunate um, and so grateful to Jane Hirschfeld for selecting this poem, which was posted uh, this week, last week, um, on the Academy of American Poets site. So I can finally read it publicly. My Einsteinicity. Let Y equal any number of fathers. Let X equal the numberless planets. Let y minus x equal long nights of fog and let x plus y equal hydra and incubus. If y is greater than x, why do all my convictions gape? If x is greater than y, does father just mean nightcap? When x divides y, we set sail on a wind jammer. When y divides x, watch for the banshee, the gin. Or let X be replaced by a midsummer night and Y by, well, you can never replace Y, but by morning, Y will lollygag near half moons, Odysseus sailing to Ithaca, mildew as it rocks. And AB is no mere theory of relativity. It is Helter Skelter Materfamilias, Ma Barker and Rebecca, the mother who deceived. Not Sarah, who couldn't conceive, but the mother of all nature, the black tern, the kittiwake, plants ornamental, baroque, 
the cumulus, the nebulosus, and yet mother of pearl and ice cold, tiger's eye and monkey in the middle. Let's say AB is a percentage of all the love in the world or synonymous with, do you love me now that I can dance? Let's agree that A is the salsa or pasta doble and B is always, always the beginning. Thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna read one last poem. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful evening. I'm, I'm just beyond excited. This is a true poem. A woman's body aging still loves itself, kisses the air that surrounds it, loves the lips in full pout, famous birthplace of all kisses, the belly, brown, round, kisses its inverted button and the shoulders. Oh, how I kiss my shoulders, my nose kissing lilies and a purpley night sky, my neck, long as forever fit for 20,000 kisses, 20,000 kisses for each cocoa breast and nipple, for the lower arms that encircle each other, then kiss, kiss. Even the airs, French kissing to tunes of Django and Debussy. The upper arms wishing to kiss their tender underarms. Thread of both hands kissing the lifeline and my cheeks colored bronze with kisses. Lashes that kiss my eyes, that kiss everything they see. My forehead, a map of the places where kisses live long. Long live my kinky hair braided with kiss after kiss after kiss. Thank you. Come back, Quentin. I'm back. Thank you, Lynn. That was incredible. Um, I just want to have all our all our readers sort of come back on screen so we can give you a little bit of a round of applause. Um, so please, everyone, just join me in saying thank you to Lynn. And thank you to all of you. I wish all our audience was here that you know they could give you a round of applause as well. Um, that was stunning. Um, I know. I, I hope this is okay with you. Hiram uh, mentioned to me that he has a couple questions for you if you'd be willing if you'd be willing to answer them. Uh, I don't know. Hiram's pretty untrustworthy, but you I know. know. <laughs> I, I was a little dubious myself, but um, you can give it a shot. Hiram yeah. trying to embarrass me. Go go for it, Hiram. Uh, one question that I had, Lynn, was what is what is the job of a poet laureate? You know, um, I think all of us have heard of that term, but might, but not, you know, we haven't read the job description, you know? Right. So what is that? So in the job description, the I'm basically supposed to be a literary ambassador for the city, both within the city and beyond the city boundaries. Um, I apparently I'll have to write an occasional poem from time to time that hasn't happened yet. So we'll see what happens on that front. Um, and to bring as much poetry to as many people as I possibly can, people that love poetry and people that think they don't love poetry and then find out that they do. Um, I, I remember one of my brothers who shall remain unnamed said, don't you have a novel in you? Uh, no, <laughs> I really like poetry. And I maintain that when things are going poorly, the person that people want for a wedding, a birth, a, a graduation, terrible event like 9-11 or January 6th, who do they want? They want the poet. So I'm going to run with that role and do everything I can to, to fulfill the expectations of the mayor. And don't tell him I said this, all of you, because you're my peeps. So especially <laughs> you, <Hiram. laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Hiram, you got, got another one for us? Don't encourage him. Because <laughs> <laughs> I will ask 49 questions. If yeah, you, yeah. If you, one if more. You, <laughs> uh, I just want to know if there's, if there's other poet laureates or rather specific acts of other poet laureates that, that you admired or and want to continue in, in that vein. Did I freeze? Am I back? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we got to wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. Um, 
Uh, Tracy K. Smith, um, who was the former National Poet Laureate, had a podcast series where every day she would read a poem. Uh, very short little show. You got your five minute bite. You do a little intro, read the poem. Um, and I thought that was terrific way for people to access poetry, whatever time of day they want in whatever way they want. So I am doing that for the city once a week. It's a lot of work to do that every day. I don't know how she did it, but um, I'm doing it once a week. I've had two posted on the library site. The first one honoring the wonderful Wanda Coleman, the unofficial poet laureate of the city. And um, the one to that was posted today honoring Ralph Angel, who so many of us know we lost suddenly and much too soon. So um, I'll be doing this weekly and I'm told that eventually they'll be on Spotify and uh, Apple iTunes and Google something or other. So look out for that. But in the meantime, you can find them on the uh, library's website. So thank you for, for giving me a chance to do my little advertisement. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. I, I can't wait to see uh, to see all the work you do as poet laureates. Um, I just want to give a few thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jimmy Vega, who's been running everything. Yay, from hey, Jimmy. Um, I want to thank all our audience for coming. Thank you. It's really nice to see so many familiar names in the audience and just hear, you know read all your comments. I wish we were all together in person. Um, and then I want to thank higher save the comments. Yeah, we can save the I comments. I wasn't able to, to respond to people all the time. So that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. We can we can uh, save those and send them to you. Um, I want to thank Hiram. I want to thank Gail. I want to thank Mariano. You guys were incredible. Um, and of course, thank you, Lynn, for reading. It was beautiful. Um, and I'm just excited to see the next two years of the Poet Laureate. Uh, position and see you again in person soon hopefully very yeah. soon thank very you soon. everyone thank you everyone that came yeah. to my fellow poets thank you i i can't imagine a better way to kick this off so from the bottom of my heart love you all thank yes, you one more round of applause thank you Woo! thank you night, and my, and my computer thank worked the whole time it's fabulous okay <laughs> <laughs> bye everybody bye